Second Corinthians chapter four, verses one to three. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Thank you, Daniel, for the scripture reading and the prayer, and Brother Ralph leading these beautiful songs today. How, how would you feel if tomorrow you turned on the TV or the internet or picked up the newspaper and saw that all these wars had ended in the world? Or you picked it up and read that abortion has been out loud in our country. There's no going to be no more abortion. Or you turned on the news and you read where everyone in Congress in Washington were standing up at the reading of the Bible and were bowing their heads in prayer to God through Jesus Christ and agreed to get along and work together and make no law or legislation that would contradict God's Word. Wouldn't that be good news? Or what if you also read the next day, now beginning this school year, there's going to be prayer and Bible reading in the school. And there's not going to be anything taught that's contrary to God's Word. Evolution will no longer be taught in colleges, university, or any public educational institution. Would that not lift you up? And if you could hear the news that they had found a cure for many diseases that people are now plagued with, wouldn't that be good news? Sadly, we hear a lot of news that's not good about terrorism, about immorality and evils done in the world, things that people are doing toward one another, and division and culture between races. It sort of brings you down sometimes, doesn't it? But friends, we want the good news. The wise man said, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Do we know today that we have the best news from far away, from God in heaven? If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 12, we read of that. Here the apostle Peter, speaking of what God had done through inspired men, says the following, unto whom it was revealed, referring to the prophets, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them, that is, inspired men, that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. I want to read briefly to you a short passage from the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 45. Many of us here today have children. Can you imagine grieving over a son or a daughter? And of course, we know what it's like to grieve over a loved one that passes away. Jacob grieved for many years over Joseph, thinking he had passing this life, had been slain by a beast because of the deceit of Joseph's envious brethren. Now many years later, Joseph is the governor of Egypt, and the brothers come back to the land of Canaan with this news for Jacob or Israel. 
And they told him all the words of Joseph which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. It revived. And Israel, that is Jacob, said, It is enough. Joseph my son is yet alive, and I will go and see him before I die. Genesis 45, verse 27 and 28. What great news that was for this old man, this loving father, Jacob, to find out Joseph was yet alive. Well, friends, today, can you believe of news that's even better than that? News that we should be thinking about every day. That's one reason I want to bring this lesson today, because of so much discouragement that's in our world, so much bad news, so many bad things happening. There is something that will lift us up, lest we become down and out and discouraged. It's the gospel of Christ. That's the good news. That Greek word eongelion means the good message, glad or joyful tidings. We first read of this being preached by God to Abraham. Now I realize that the gospel in its fullness, as was preached in the book of Acts and as revealed in the New Testament, was not preached to Abraham. But yet God gave a prophecy to Abraham that would point to the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ to be declared in the New Testament. And the Apostle Paul refers to this in the book of Galatians, the third chapter, and verse number 8. And the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that is the Gentiles, the nations, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, and here is the gospel that he preached to Abraham, In thee shall all nations be blessed. That's Galatians 3, verse 8. And here is that good news as it is found. It is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verse 3, and in chapter 22, verse 18, that in Abraham and through his seed would all nations, all families of the earth be blessed. Now this is a particular prophecy, not to the land promises, that would become the descendants of Abraham, the children of Israel over in the promised land. But this is a more important promise than that. It is the promise of salvation. And the particular one in whom this salvation would come as a descendant of Abraham would be none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <coughs> And Paul interprets that for us and makes it known in the book of Galatians, the third chapter, verse 6, as to what the word seed means. When in Abraham's seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, not and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. Now here's the gospel that God preached to Abraham. It would be a blessing of salvation for all nations, and it would come in and through Jesus Christ. I know Abraham did not know all of that, all the import of it at that time. But he was pointing to Christ and the gospel that would one day come. Now, in Luke chapter 2, there's also an insightful statement regarding the gospel. This is the verb form of euangelio to declare or announce the good tidings, the glad or joyful news. It was the angel who announced this news to the shepherds who were keeping their flock by watch by night when the Lord was born in Luke chapter 2. And the angel said unto them, the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. That's a description of the gospel. 
which shall be to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Christ being born into the world made possible the church and the gospel. Because had he not been born, he would not have been able to die upon the cross. The three great facts of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, declared to be the Son of God, Romans 1, 4, died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the Scriptures. Now, this is the idea of the gospel, the good news. I appreciate Brother Roth leading that song, The Gospel is for All. Because that's what God said to Abraham. It will be for all. There in Genesis, and here as cited by Paul in Galatians chapter 3, that it would be for all nations. All nations would be blessed. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Matthew 28, 19. The gospel is for all. The gospel is for all. Well, what is the gospel? And we've already indicated this by what we've said, but it is the glad or joyful tidings, a good message from God above to man. The good news. When we dwell on the gospel from day to day, we're not going to be dragged down by the things of this world and become discouraged and depressed by so much bad news and so much evil in the world. Christ brought the gospel to man to lift man up above sin and the destitute spiritually condition that man is in without hope, without God and without salvation. We should be thankful for the gospel, every one. The gospel is glad or joyful tidings. It is the good news which Jesus intends to be preached to all people. Mark 16, 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. God is depending on us to do that as the followers of Christ. To see that the gospel is preached to all people. In 2 Corinthians 4, Daniel wrote, read the first three verses. But in verse number 4 and 5, this is what Paul said. He said in verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Verse 4, In whom the God of this world, referring to Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake. Paul indicates here that the gospel is glorious. The glorious gospel of Christ. He speaks of the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. And he also, in the next verse, speaks of preaching Christ Jesus the Lord. Hence, to preach the gospel is to preach Christ. It is glorious because it tells of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. It is glorious because it came down from God in heaven to man through the Holy Spirit unto inspired men, which we now have on the pages of the New Testament. It is glorious because God gave it. And it tells of the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the blessed and only potentate, Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 6, 15. It is glorious because it tells of the church where God is glorified. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. Throughout all ages were without end. Amen. Ephesians 3, 20. It is glorious because it teaches man how to glorify God. For you are bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. It is glorious. It is eternal. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. 1 Peter 1.25 
The gospel of Christ is good news and it is glorious because it is God's power to save man's precious soul. In Romans 1.16, Paul declared, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and through salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I would also submit unto us today that the gospel is glorious because it teaches us what Christ has abolished and done away with. If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 10. But is now, Paul said, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Let's begin at the last part first. Life and immortality has been brought to life through the gospel. The way to have life and immortality is made known through the gospel. Of course, mortality refers to death. Immortality means to be without death. Now we know that gospel, the gospel has not destroyed physical death because people still die. But through Christ and the gospel, the death that comes by sin has been abolished because Christ took away that which causes death, sin. And he burst the bonds of death and the resurrection. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is that good news or not? Not because of sin. That's not good news. But Christ's blood takes away that which causes death. We read of Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Jesus Christ, of course. Revelation 1.5. And He has abolished death. He took it out of the way and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Because of Christ, we can have the abundant life, John 10, 10. And we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6, verse 23. That's everlasting life that never ends. Let's turn back to the book of Revelation. This is about heaven, Revelation 21. The gospel tells us not only about heaven, <laughs> God doesn't dangle a picture of heaven out there in front of us and we just keep reaching for it, but we can't get it. No. We can lay hold on eternal life, 1 Timothy 6 12. And of course, that's future and eternity. The hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, Titus 1 2. He doesn't dangle it out there and say, oh, it's just beyond your reach. Or I'll show it to you, but I'm not going to tell you how to get it. No, through the gospel, not only do we learn of eternal life in heaven, we learn how to get there. We find out how to get to heaven. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's talking about in heaven. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. And that includes no cause for sorrow or crying, too. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That's in heaven. And yet there are people to this day they refuse that blessing. They refuse that opportunity. Yes, the gospel not only tells us that we can be saved, it tells us how to be saved. The glad or joyful tidings of God's love and concern for our souls is declared in the gospel. Now that tells us of our value and importance to God. We need to hear that. The world will tell us, oh, you're not worth anything unless you've got a lot of money or you got a high position or you're beautiful and glamorous and all this business. But God tells us 
that your soul is worth the giving of my son on the cross. That's what the gospel tells us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul speaks of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Galatians 2.20 What would God do for me? Here it is. Declared in the Gospel. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that not glad or joyful tidings? Now, if you go over to Colossians first chapter, verse number 5, we see that it's through the Gospel that we have hope. Something that we can't have in, through this world. And I don't mean we can't have it while we're in this world or in this life, but we cannot have it from the world. The world doesn't give us hope. Philosophers and governmental leaders don't give us hope. The hope is in Jesus Christ, my beloved friend, nowhere else. He is our hope. First Timothy 1.1 1, 1. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 Colossians 1.5 tells us that it's through the gospel we have that hope. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. How does man have hope? It's through the gospel. You look at this old world, we, don't, we look around us, what hope does the world have? Without Christ, there is no hope. The Ephesians in chapter 2 were told that before they had no hope. They were without God, they were without Christ. Verse number 12, but now, that is now that you're in the Lord, now in Christ Jesus, you sometimes are far off or made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now you have that hope. <coughs> The gospel leads people to trust in the Lord and to faith. Where will you be without faith and hope from day into day? Well, you'll be where a lot of people are. And we have a lot of people that claim to be Christians that don't pray like they ought to. Why? They don't have faith in the Lord like they should. When you have faith and trust in the Lord, you are going to pray. And you truly have faith in Him, as you should. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, the first part of verse 13, <coughs> that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now when did you begin to trust the Lord and have faith in Him? When you heard the gospel. Some people here, they still don't trust the Lord. They still don't believe. But God has designed His Word that if our hearts are what they ought to be, God's Word will produce faith and trust. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It produces faith in our hearts, without which we cannot be saved, and without which we cannot have true peace and joy, without faith in the Lord. The wise man said, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. The gospel is also the gospel of the resurrection. In 2 Peter 2, 8, Paul said, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. That is the gospel that I preach. The gospel of Christ leads to salvation. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul said, For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. <clears throat> now, before we close here shortly, there are facts to be believed in the gospel which we've already indicated that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died for our sins, According to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And the fact that He has established the church, Matthew 16, 18, and He desires for us all to come to Him, 1 Timothy 2, 4, 2 Peter 3, 9. 
We must believe these things and act accordingly upon them. In the gospel, there are commands to be obeyed. We've already indicated this. We are to hear and believe the gospel. We are to repent, that is, have a change of mind leading to a change of life and turning unto God, Acts 2.38, Acts 3.19. And before we can be baptized, we must confess the name of the Lord as the Ethiopian did in Acts 8.37. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then following that, he and Philip went down into the water and Philip baptized him and he came up out of the water and went on his way rejoicing according to verses 38 and 39. We read in Acts 8, verse 8, when Philip went down to Samaria to preach Christ, in verse 5, to preach the gospel, there was great joy in that city. Acts 8, 8. The gospel brings joy. But it's not just people like the eunuch who was just baptized. But a long time after we've been baptized, we should have that joy in the Lord. Philippians 4.4. 4. We shouldn't lose it right after we've been baptized. Of course, those who are not in Christ, not been baptized in Christ, Galatians 3.27, cannot have that joy. But there was great joy in that city. Now there's a statement that Luke records in the book of Acts, a very short statement, but a powerful one. When Paul and Barnabas came to Derby and Lystra and the regions round about. Verse 7, And there they preached the gospel. They brought light to that region when they preached the gospel. They brought light. Without the gospel, man is in darkness, groping in sin and doom and despair and hopelessness. But with Christ and the gospel, there is light. There is hope. There is strength to go on. There is hope for the future. There are many blessings revealed in the gospel. That's the third thing. Facts to be believed. Commands to be obeyed. But then... Promises to be enjoyed. The exceeding precious promises of Christ, we read of those in 2 Peter 1 4. We don't read of them detailed one by one, but we read that expression. They are exceeding great and precious <coughs> promises, according to the Apostle Peter. There is the promise of salvation and eternal life. There is the promise of fellowship with God and the cleansing of His blood and His abiding presence. And membership in the church of our Lord, and all the many blessings in spiritual play, play, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, verse number 3. Now, friends, I want to say this regarding the gospel. It is the only way that God is going to call people unto Him, there's no other way. Contrary to what all these different denominations are teaching. Oh, the Lord called me. I was out there riding my horse through the woods. And the Lord spoke to me out above the trees and all this business. <coughs> or the Lord talked to my heart and told me I was saved. That the Holy Spirit came on me and told me I was a saved person. That's not how the Lord calls us. Why would the Lord talk to you like that and not talk to me? He talks to us all the same way through the gospel. And that's the only fair way because it is to be preached to every creature. Mark 16, 15. If you turn to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14, you see how God calls man unto him. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate, what the Lord wants us to have, is glory with Christ in heaven and eternity. That's what the Lord wants. He wants us all to be there. But the choice is up to us as to whether we will take it or not. I want to relate this story. In 1829, two men, George Wilson and James Porter, robbed a U.S. mail carrier. In May 1830, both men were found guilty of six charges, including robbery of the mail and putting the life of the driver in jeopardy. Both men received their sentences. 
execution by hanging to be carried out on July the 2nd. <clears throat> Porter was executed on schedule, but Wilson had influential friends to plead for mercy to the President of the United States, Andrew Jackson. The President issued a formal pardon and Wilson would have to serve only a prison term of 20 years, but he wouldn't be executed. Yet George Wilson refused the pardon. The U.S. Supreme Court determined the court, quote, the court cannot give the prisoner the benefit of the pardon unless he claims the benefit of it. It is a grant to him, it is his property, and he may accept it or not as he pleases. Chief Justice John Marshall made this statement. A pardon is an act of grace proceeding from the power entrusted with the execution of laws, but delivery is not completed without acceptance. It may then be rejected by the person to whom it is tendered, and we have no power in a court but to force it to force it on him. We have no power in court to force the pardon on him. End of quote. When Wilson refused the pardon, he chose death. Now apply that to the gospel. When people refuse the gospel, they refuse life. They refuse salvation. They refuse eternal life. They choose death by sin and to die eternally away from God in the lake of fire and brimstone forever and ever, which is the second death, Revelation 21, 8. That's what they choose. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. So, God gives us the gospel out of His great love and Christ out of His tremendous love and the sacrifice that He made provides salvation by the gospel. And we can choose that if we want to. Or we can choose death. We can be destroyed by rejecting the gospel of Christ, the power of God, and through salvation. So in order to accept it, as we've said, we must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We must repent, confess Him before men, and be baptized in His name. Be buried with Christ in baptism. Rise to walk in the unison of life. Romans 6, 4. But after that, we must be faithful. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. That's one thing we're taught in the Gospel. We must love the Lord and obey Him and be faithful to Him if we're to be saved. We must... Continue in the faith. Grounded and settled. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Colossians 1.23 Many people in the church have moved away from that hope. They once obeyed it and claimed that hope. But they have been moved away from it. By false doctrine, by worldliness, the love of sin, indifference, lukewarmness, and neglect, they have moved away. They have lost the hope that they once had in Jesus Christ. The Lord invites us to come this morning if we have need to obey the gospel, plan of salvation, or to repent and return to our first love, confess our sin, and seek the prayers of the faithful, Acts 8, 22, 24. If you need to come, we encourage you to do so. While we stand and we sing together. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, the greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved. Resolve to enter the kingdom.
Thank <laughs> you. 